So good evening, everyone, and a big welcome to this pre-election webinar hosted by Raymac Marketing. I know that Zoom lets people in, so there's still a lot of people joining as we speak. But by way of introduction, my name is Stefan Boita, and I'm the director of Raymac Marketing. And as we sit tonight, we are less than seven days away from the most significant and historic election in East Asia since 94. So I'm going to make sure that I do less of the talking and get out the way. But if the one thing I do know is the property market and understanding how a strong property market has such a big impact on the economy as a whole in terms of infrastructure, job creation, rates, income, housing delivery, and just the, the, the incredible benefit for South Africans of all income categories to build generational wealth through property ownership. There is no crystal ball whatsoever, but there is a lot of knowledge and insights, and we want to be able to unpack that in an open, honest and real discussion. And that's always been the forum around these webinars. We want it to be engaging. And hopefully those of you who are listening and have made the time to do it can walk away with thought provoking and, 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 and insights that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. So we only have an hour and there's a lot to unpack. So gonna try and get into things as quickly as we can. And, but I do need to go through the introductions and I'm doing those in, in no particular order. But I think just a, a start off and a big welcome to our panelists. We are very grateful for all of your time. We know how hectic all of you are, your investment roadshows. There's so much happening at the moment. Uh, Professor JJ Tavani, a big welcome. A political commentator probably needs no introduction to a lot of you who, who are watching, businessmen and hosts of the Power to Truth and ENCA. And uh, I must be honest that I have watched hours of footage of, of JJ in the weeks and days leading up to this and have just been blown away by the level of depth of insight and it has been it has been very very interesting so i'm um, yeah, very grateful for that and really looking forward to hearing what you have to say and Thank then um, rob, and thanks very much and then rob Vesselo is the ceo of international housing solutions rob i know that you are on investor roadshow as you speak i know you're in soccer in a, in a, in a hotel room and, and very grateful for your time too and the impact that you guys have on the property market uh, throughout the country. We um, just apologies from Ashila Pajeng, who has been on quite a few of our webinars historically and also a, a wealth of wisdom. He is fl flights have been delayed, as I think a lot of flights have been delayed at the moment and uh, basically would have joined late. So we just, we just thanked him, but uh, unfortunately he won't be joining this evening. And then Steve Brooks, CEO of Baldwin Properties. Uh, fortunate to have had Steve on, on a number of our panels before. And obviously, we don't have to talk about the huge impact that Baldwin has had on development throughout the country. So welcome, Steve. Thank you. And then uh, Carlos Correa, who's the CEO of the Fundamentum Property Group. And as an as a entity, are spearheading effectively a new city outside Hillcrest in terms of West Town and um, yeah, a business leader who have a huge amount of, of respect for. And thanks very much for joining us, Carlos. Good evening. Thank you. So, and I think as, as you can see it in terms of panelists, we've just got business leaders who are heavily invested in the future of this country and all want to see prosperity for the future. And that's really where we want to kick off this, this discussion. So JJ, I want to bring you in, in straight off the bat. I'm going to ask you a lot of the, the hard questions, but I think we all know that there's talk about so many different scenarios that can exist beyond May 29. And it all largely depends, I guess, in terms of what the ANC achieves on national level. So many different uh, reports and polls in terms of anywhere tracking between 40 and 50%. And I think the question to you is, in your opinion, what is the most likely scenario we're going to see? Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I hope you can hear me clearly. The, as you said, there's no crystal ball, really we can only uh, look at historically what has happened. If you remember 2019, prior to 2019 election, there was a similar hype about this being the last election the ANC will dominate and what have you. And they still uh, declined, but only declined to 57%. Uh, right, so that's the last national election. But if you look at the last local government elections, uh, which obviously are not the same thing, but it can give you an indication that uh, uh, for the ANC to fall below 50 is not an impossibility. It's just that the kind of timing we have now that combines the hype about 30 years of democracy um, and also that 
that uh, has thrown the ANC into a panic. I'm sure you have seen them mobilizing, uh, you know, former presidents and veterans going out there to say to people, please still vote for the ANC. The last is that while the polls put them at 43%, which is the latest poll, uh, the polls must always be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, if you look at the um, a factor like the, the the social grants, that factor has almost multiplied since the last election. So in, in 1994, there were 2 million people on social grants. Um, in 2024, there are 26 million people on social grants. So if you do a poll and you don't get to the most rural areas where the only means of survival for that population are social grants, your poll is, is likely to be distorted. That's why uh, the NC may surprise us, despite what the polls say, to be at the 53%. So for me, that's the most likely scenario. If that happens, I suppose you'll have little to worry about because it's a continuation of the status quo. The ANC is not promising a lot of changes in his manifesto. In fact, his manifesto is largely a rehash of the last one. So, you know, I suppose the market likes things like that, which are, you know, they talk about stability and so on. But let me hasten to say that uh, there's a, there, we are sitting on a time bomb on various fronts. Uh, the unemployment rate is completely unacceptable. It's up, up some sixty nine percent of young, young people being unemployed. We are the most unequal society in the world. You got fourteen million people who are going to bed hungry. You know, I can go on. You got an economic growth of zero point three. All of those things means that we are on 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 the precipice if we don't sort out the inequality. In other words, if we don't create a system that will bring up those who feel marginalized. And that's what people are hoping for, that your second scenario could be if the NC falls below 50%, it may then need other partners, right? Uh, either on the right or the left of politics to to then partner with them in moving the, some of the policies they adopted long ago a little bit forward. So that's your second scenario. NC falls below 50, but doesn't fall so too far below 50. It falls enough just to get the small parties to get it over the line. Or if it falls way below, like the polls are suggesting at 43, it may need either the DA or the EFF, right, uh, to to actually govern in a stable way. Because you also don't want a government that has 10 parties, like we've seen in Johannesburg, where it results in chaos. So okay. it, it may well be that despite the hype, we will end up at 53% of the ANC, which means they'll just continue uh, governing. Right? Uh, second scenario, which is, uh, which is, pro, uh, which is uh, predicted by the polls, which are by nature not necessarily reliable, right? is that the ANC falls below and it requires one of these uh, extremes, either the left at EFF or the right with the DA. Okay. Um, don't ask me if for now which one, which one I would prefer. <laughs> we can talk about it later. But I know that yeah. if you are in property, you will panic uh, if the EFF comes to power. Yeah, the, the I, second... I actually want to ask you about that 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 doomsday yeah. scenario a little bit later. But but I mean, I think what I'm hearing is that because the ANC are so mobilized on the ground, that that 43 yeah. is probably going to be a little bit higher come next Wednesday. Yes. Yes, but also I think we, we the, the doomsday thing is a label of the DA. Uh, yeah. So it's not a universal label. I'll tell you why. It's an, actually an exaggerated thing because the EFF the, is only at 11%. In other words, if, with all the goodwill in the world and all the influence in the world, if they get into a coalition, they cannot insist on their policies that are seen by the other parties as extreme. So, so this thing that if the EFF is part of a coalition, the rent is going to be 20 rent uh, is an exaggeration because EFF 
even with the best scenario in February, the polls put them only at 15%. In fact, the February poll was putting them neck to neck with the DA as a possible official opposition. Uh, but if you actually want stability, my, you, you'll be surprised that, in fact, the EFF, the ANC coalition may be the best thing you need because their policies are not far apart. The ANC has talked about yeah. the state bank. They have talked about expropriation of land. They may differ about the mechanism, but you are not going to have squabbles like if you put the DA and ANC together. The, the DA says cancel affirmative action, cancel employment equity, don't bother about redress, and all of those things that uh, I don't have time to go through. But uh, if you are in property uh, and and you, you are fed, a, you know, a line that the EFF is going to take away property rights. The EFF is in no position to do that and until they are 50 percent, in fact, two thirds. They are very far away from two thirds. So sometimes we, we just get uh, unnecessary fear mongering. Uh, if you want stability here, you don't need multiple parties. You need one or two parties to agree and have a deal and they can hold each other to account. Right? A DA a, 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 a ANC scenario could possibly potentially work and it may only arise out of personality clashes because remember there are a lot of people who are uh, still a bitter with Malema and what have you and the Malema is a very domineering personality so they, they may be scared to say if we give him a position he'll overshadow everybody and unfortunately politics also have to do with egos so that could what that, that's what could land you with a and ANC, um, a DA. Finally, I think, with all considered, the country is in such a crisis, given the statistics I gave you, from economic growth to unemployment, etc., that maybe you need a government of national unity where you can get the best out of all these parties and say to them, guys, just just solve the country's problems. Um, but it doesn't look like too many people share that sentiment. Let me pause there. But um, no, but I appreciate it. it makes, I think it makes all of us feel uh, feel a lot better. And Steve, I mean, what are your thoughts then? And what do you see in terms of next Wednesday and the positive impacts on the property market going forward? You know, 1994, we bought lots of baked beans. Then we had the, you know, the South Africans love these doomsday moments. You know, we're a hell of a resilient society. We're a new democracy. You know, we've got lots of hope in this country. We, you know, I've been saying it time and time again. We need two fundamentals in this country. Education, meaning education, training. We need to get some trade schools back out there, get the people working. And the most important thing is infrastructure. You know, we in, in Gauteng, Natal, we've got infrastructure, but it hasn't been maintained. You know, some simple maintenance will eradicate a lot of problems. And then we need some new, new infrastructure. I mean... What one of my colleagues, um, Carlos Correa, has managed to achieve in West West Town is creating a whole new city there with infrastructure. And the most important thing that he's done, other than being a very nice guy, is his infrastructure. You know, guys like like Borwin, when we see that commitment to infrastructure, we're right right there supporting him. You know, the Western Cape, we support them because they've they've put in some infrastructure. You know, so it's it really is a it really is a, a fundamental part of any property developer. Uh, thanks, Steve. And and I just and just a quick one. In terms of any questions that any of you guys have, please post them at the bottom. I know there are some questions coming through, but we want to try and answer as many of those as we possibly can uh, throughout the session. Uh, Carlos, uh, what are your thoughts there? Mm, thank you. Yes, I mean I was very interested, like you. I'm a big follower of the professor. JJ shows and, and I love the way he confronts and he tells the truth and so it's great to have him on the show and yeah I, I I'm a businessman I'm, I'm not a politician um, but if if perhaps from a business perspective and a personal business perspective I think there'd be more maturity at level of national and provincial level than at local government where there's been coalitions and I think that could be something good for our country. It could be something novel. It could be something that 
everybody then has got to work together. I think if we carry on the way we've been run at the moment, I think we will face more and more challenges and our economic growth and our unemployment will carry on and the youth will get more and more disillusioned. And that is a reality. But from our side as business, um, and specifically, we live in a province that, as you all know, that is very sensitive about politics. And we've experienced some of those challenges. Um, and yet, I think the word Steve used was resilient. There is a resilience in South Africans that we tend to get up and carry on again. And we've had 94 and 2000 and all the elections that have come along. And there's always been things that people don't like and people leave the country. And I have a lot of friends who have left and they come back because ultimately through and through, we love this country and we carry on investing in it. So I hope that the electorate is sensible about these elections because I think it will be challenging to have the ANC uh, uh, in a position whereby they again dictate the next five years without having some coalition partners in there who could maybe add value to our country. Uh, personal view. And then, uh, Rob, I mean, well, we mentioned that you're currently on Investor Roadshow, and I think my question would be in terms of election outcomes, how will that influence investor confidence in SA, both positively and negatively? So, um, uh, thanks, um, Seth. There's, there's no doubt that they care uh, a lot about the outcome of the election. And uh, to JJ's point, I think it's a little bit ironic that probably to most investors, a, a, a win, a marginal win by the ANC is probably the most stable outcome. Um, I think everyone is a little bit worried about... Um, about coalitions, but I, I share Carlos's view. Um, I think the best thing that can happen in a democracy is that a party that honestly for the last 30 years hasn't felt accountable uh, starts to feel accountable. And and I, I think the best way to do that in any democracy is, you know, if you make big mistakes, you should be voted out. I think uh, in our country for the last while, there have been big mistakes made. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't say for 30 years, but certainly for 10 or 15. Um, and the ruling party hasn't been voted out. And then you get to a, a point where you believe that you can do anything and you're never going to be held accountable. I actually do think that right now the ANC feels that they are being held accountable. And I feel that as a result of that, we are seeing some improvements, you know, whether it's Eskom or, or rail or decisions being made at the ports. Um, it's not enough, but I actually think that is as a result of democracy being at play, i.e. they are worried that they're going to get voted out and that's making them do, they have great policies. The ANC has fantastic policies if only implemented. Um, I'm sitting uh, in Namibia at the moment, another country with really good policies, a stable government, and they're implementing their policies and the last quarter the economy grew by 7%. And the runway is that that's going to, significantly improve um, over a period of time. So I think the biggest thing that we need for the property market and for the country, and that will provide you know, infrastructure and the like jobs, all of these things that we need, we need growth. You know? And the, the policies of the current government actually talk to growth. They're just not being implemented. So I don't think it'll be a bad idea if they have a coalition partner that assists, assists them. And, and, and to be honest, Maybe even uh, Ramaphosa in his final term will act more than talk and we can see some of these policies being implemented and, and I, I think we are starting to see some progress and the sort of strong coalition between business and government at the moment has seen some significant moves. But, you know, we need growth. If you look at the property market and all sectors of the property between 2000 and 2007, eight. Um, you know, we, we had growth, we had, you know, four, five, 6% growth, but, you know, resident, the residential market in those days, uh, property prices were, were growing by, you know, 20%, 30% in some years. Um, and that's important, you know, for, for the middle and lower class to get into the property market. And it's their biggest investment, their biggest acquisition for that property price to grow significantly, significantly and create wealth 
uh, you know, for for families that sometimes haven't had that generational opportunity, it's very very important. So, I, I would put growth, a, a government that wants growth and that attracts the kind of investment that needs growth, I, I think is the most important thing. I, I, and it might just be perception, but you know the people that I talk to, and as you know, IHS is a private equity company. We attract a lot of foreign direct investment mostly from big DFIs, uh, multinational DFIs, um, they, were, they are terrified that the EFF will have anything to, to do with, with power in this country. So um, my, my view, I, have to, I don't often disagree with you, Prof. I watch a lot of your programs, and like Carla said, I love the way that you talk. Uh, to power. So now, now I'm speaking truth to power. <laughs> I think it, it, might, it, might be, it might be short term, but I think if there's an... ANC EFF coalition, I think it will weaken the rand, um, and I think that will be inflationary, and I think that will dampen growth. It will, uh, because of the rand strength, have, have a longer term uh, impact on interest rates, and we've seen that's not good for the property market. Um, yeah, you know, Steph, maybe later I can talk to the rent market, which it is good for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, that that my primary my primary outcome that I would love from this election is either an ANC that acts according to its policies or a coalition that that sees those policies implemented because they are there. Yeah. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm very grateful for all the questions coming through. And we're going to get onto those because there's a lot of, uh, about housing delivery and, and various different things. But JJ, I want to ask you two questions bundled into one. Firstly, um, in, in, in the context of this country, can a multi-party government work in terms of solving the issues that Rob and Steve and so forth have have uh, highlighted? And then secondly, if, 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 if I may, is is obviously the developers we talk about have got really large footprints in Harting, KZN and the Western Cape, which are traditionally, uh, we've spoken about traditional uh, battleground provinces. And just in terms of what the outcomes you predict at provincial level, and what will that do for the investment potential within those different provinces? Yeah. Look, I mean, the uh, the, the provincial, uh, should start with your second question. I think the DA will still scrape through in the Western Cape, although the polls are predicting slightly less uh, because there's a PA factor uh, in the Western Cape. But yeah, I, I don't think it will debase the, 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 the DA. I think the DA has a very solid base in the Western Cape both at city level and the provincial level. So I think that one, I don't think, and the NZ won't, won't come anywhere close to 50% in the Western Cape. They have no history of uh, re-imaging after being out of office. <laughs> the, the KZN is going to be a coalition government. We just don't know which, uh, which, which, quali which coalition partners will end up there. Because the MK factor is very strong in the Western Cape. Sorry, in KZN, given Zuma's charisma and what have you. I mean, they, they are being placed at 46%. It's very high uh, for any party, uh, which has just been formed six, well, was literally six or seven months ago. So KZN is, is uh, the ANC is not going to win KZN. That they are so far below in predictions that it's not funny. I think they are at 14% or something. <clears throat> so... The IFP, maybe an MK could get together in the EFF to 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 just go over the line. But the NC definitely they are, they are, they are going to marginalize it because it's a it's a deeply fractious relationship that has formed or that occasioned the the birth of MK. So I don't think they'll go back to the NC to have a coalition so fresh when the wound is still so fresh. They're taking each other to court. I mean, it's just been so messy. Houteng, remember Houteng last time, the NC won by no margin at all. I think they got 50%, which uh, looked very suspicious in the first place. Uh, but Panyaza has been doing a lot of work, and they may just go over the line again. Uh, but also there's a possibility of a coalition, uh, but it won't be, like if they fall below 50, it will be by a small margin, and they can get one or two of their friends you know, the small parties to get them over the line. I quite like Banyaza, and I think it will be good for Houding to carry on with what he has started. 
So that's my prediction of the three provinces. The others are just reds and mice. We don't need to bother about them. Uh, the ANC dominates most of those provinces uh, because they have a clear rural base. Mpumalanga, seriously rural. Uh, in Limpopo and Eastern Cape. So that's the, uh, yeah. the, 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 second, the first question. Can you just remind me quickly? No, no. I, th I think the first question was just whether a multi-party coalition government can work oh, in this country. Right. Yes. Yeah. No. 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 Remember, and I was saying this in another conversation yesterday. A coalition is not a, a wish of anybody. It's a it's a, it's a consequence of how the voters vote. So if your voters don't vote decisively, uh, you have to make it work. So I mean, we 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 don't have another country to go to. So that's why I like the idea that there's there'll be more maturity at national level. But also the choices of coalition partners, right, uh, may just uh, uh, create stability or not. Uh, what, am I, what do I mean? In Johannesburg, the coalition there is, I think it has 10 parties. And you could, I mean, it's crazy. How do you coordinate 10 parties? So what ends up happening is that every party runs its portfolio as an island. And if imagine if you did that nationally, that would be chaos. But let's remember also, and that's why it's important that at national level, you only have two or three parties, not 20, right? Even if you're at the government of national unity, which I think, which I'm, I'm a proponent of, you can't have 10 parties because it's going to be chaos. You still need to pick the top three and say, let's, guys, DA, EFF, ANC, top three, let's work together. Uh, and, and, and they will then hold each other accountable. Right. I, I truly don't I believe it's a scary, it's a scare tactic about the rent. And what I tell you why we are sitting with a time bomb. And I think people mi misread this. The, the, if, if we are sitting on a time bomb, it means that there is a, a hunger for, for change and a hunger for transformation and a hunger for inclusive economy. At the moment, the economy is not inclusive. You understand? I mean, if you look at the health sector, I know that the NHI is a bit of an election gimmick, but I want to use this as an example. People with access to proper medical services and, 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 and facilities are 14% of the population. The rest have to wait in line to die at Baraguana and Tembisa Hospital and what have you. I, I don't know whether you have been to any of those hospitals. You know, the other day, people were in a taxi accident, and I just happened to have two staff members in that taxi uh, that overturned. Uh, and they were taken to a, a private hospital, sorry, a public hospital in Krugersdorp. It was 8 a.m. When I went to, 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 to go and check on them, a doctor had not seen them by 2 p.m. That's how chaotic our health system is. Now, if you've got a party that doesn't care about those type of things, they don't care about the fact that people, 14 million people are starving, they don't have food. So if you say to them, let's establish food banks, they'll say, no, who's going to pay for it? We can't do it, right? So we may want a stability of the rent, but that's a short-term gain because the rent by its nature is inconsistent, right? Six months ago, maybe it would, it would have been at 15, now it's approaching 20, but it could also, also swing back, right? Uh, so the, the, the status quo cannot be justified. You can't be growing at 0.3%. And then want to, to uh, that's why you can't do the same thing. In other words, the continuation of the ANC on a straight line is not desirable for the for, for for quelling this time bomb that I'm talking about. You need something different, and unfortunately, some that different thing may be in an extreme view that that is within the DA or within the EFF. All you need to do is to make sure that you can have a happy medium. That's what coalitions are about. Coalition is not to arrive and insist on your policy. And once again, uh, it, I want to say it's a scare tactic if the rent will weaken by a, an 11 percent party. I mean, the EFF is far from being a majority. They could be outvoted half the time, right? So I think what will be important is to, to look at what is necessary for our country to survive the time bomb of youth unemployment, of un inequality, of poverty, of starvation and all of these things. That, by the way, don't bother much of the, the, the middle class because they are fine. You understand? They're getting, I mean, you, if you look at the bank CEO, I mean, you understand? 138 million rand salary. You look at that mining CEO uh, uh, there at Sibanya, 300 million. 
salary. And then he refuses to give 1,000 rand to the workers. He could pay them from his own pocket and have stability in that mine. Because what is he going to do with 300 million rand? That's, those are the kind of gaps and chasms that are in our society. And the, 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 sometimes when you talk about stability, we, we, we think in stability of maintaining what we have. That's already bad. You can't justify 0.3% growth. You can't. When we used to grow at 5% under Mbeki, right? And we are saying by 2030, we'll grow by 6%. We are so far away from that target. And it's clear that something new has to happen. It don't be perfect but it cannot be the same. That one we need to just get into our, our heads if we want this country to go, to go ahead. So short answer, this country will, will have to work, even if it's a coalition that we may not think is perfect. Secondly, I believe that instead of a left-leaning coalition of ANC EFF or right-leaning one of ANC DA, you could bring all this together so that you are in the center. And we, are, we focus on these time bombs that I'm talking about rather than ideological differences. And what, what will create stability at national level is if you have fewer parties, not more. Local government is fine because you are dealing with, you know, uh, basic services, etc. Maybe you don't need to sit there and have an ideological argument. But on national level, you can't have an ideological argument with 10 parties. You will never get anything done. So you need to have two or three parties coming together. Uh, and I think it will, it will, there's no reason why it can't work. It has worked in other countries. It, we are not unique in, in, in coalitions uh, at all. It worked even here. We had the government of national unity. Let's just remember. With the worst of enemies. <laughs> you understand? The National Party and ANC yeah. were uh, diametrically opposed. But the first two or three years of our democracy, they, they, they co-governed. And there was, no, there was no crisis. The sky didn't fall. So this thing, this idea that you know, it's like when, when, when people said, if Mandela goes, it's the same theme. If Mandela goes, the country is going to fall apart. No, the, the country didn't fall apart. And Becky came, he did a good job, you know, uh, and we, it, it, the country fell apart on his own under Zuma. You know, and Ramaphosa tried to rescue it, but I think he has not succeeded much. Those guys are tired. We need a, a, a coalition government where, they, where their are tiredness can be diluted so that we can make progress. So, that's my view. Thank you. No, no, no I, I appreciate it. And I, and I think, like you're saying, a lot of people don't actually remember or realize that we did have a government to national unity in 94. And like you say, there were a lot of friends and foes involved there. Um, but I, I just want to touch on the socioeconomic challenges because a lot of the questions are actually related to employment, housing, and inequality. And Steve, I want to direct this to you. And then I also want Rob and, and Carlos to come in. So one of the questions from Christopher Ellis, and I think it's a lot of questions we've all asked, is it says, I've always viewed Baldwin developments as great for mass residential solutions. Would it not be wise for Baldwin to get into negotiation with government regarding low-cost housing solutions? Obviously not as lavish, but as a base solution. And um, I guess it, it, it says, how do we, as, how do the US private sector help solve the, the housing crisis we have throughout the country? Is that possible? <laughs> Yeah, look, uh, that's a great question. But, you know, um, I'm actually writing my autobiography at the moment. And my autobiography is about a partnership. You know, generally, most developers out there are in partnership already with government. We have to be. You know, we have to link up our sewage. We have to link up our water. We have to link up our electricity. So, you know, it's, it's a public-private participation by nature, development is. And then, obviously, you've got the public it needs to come along and buy. So you partner them with the public. So we've tried desperately with, with high-level government, right up to a senior level. But, you know, the, the will is there, but the reality of actually making it happen is very poor, very, very poor. And it, it just amazes me. You know, we've got our green brand, which is our, our level below a million, which is, is not for the poor people. It is for the lower middle class. But, you know, the, 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 the reaction we get from government is shocking. It's absolutely shocking. So those partnerships should be there. I mean, we've got a magnificent development in Moycliff. Um, it's a large, large development. We were promised an insane amount of government intervention. I think at the opening, I think we had every single minister there. And, you know, it just all petered out. And that's what happens. It just all fades away into 
nothingness. Um, not that we're giving up. Trust me, I'm not giving up in the slightest. We're still, we're still getting on with it. But you know, it's, it's it really is tough out there, and it shouldn't be. I mean, at the moment, there's a massive backlog. What Carlos has managed to do, I still don't know how you've done it, Carlos. You, you're a wizard. How you managed to get your infrastructure right? What Rob's doing with with his brand is fantastic. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of good, very solid people out there. Government, they, they generally treat us developers like absolute dirt. You know, we have to beg. Um, they should open their, you know, I'm busy looking at something in Mauritius at the moment. And, you know, the, the economic development division or department came to our offices and saw us. I mean, jeepers, when have you ever heard of something like that? You know, and welcomed us with open arms. That's what we need to do in government. Yes, welcome the guys like Rob, Carlos, Professor, um, yourself, Steph, that are doing a lot of marketing, you know, and get on with it. Um, there's these massive databases that are out there of people that need housing. I mean, try and get your hands on a database of people that need housing. It's like a big secret. Why is it not published? Let myself and Rob and Carlos fight for it. And let the other guys all come and fight and, and, and get it competitive and do a good job for all our clients. And, and Rob, what are your thoughts? I can, can maybe add to that. Yeah. Obviously, we okay. operate only in the affordable market. Um, so affordable, and we we also do social housing now. With social housing is a partnership with a grant. We, I mean, it is a partnership with the government. We have to work with the SHRA and and get SHRA approval, and then we operate in the very low LSM market. Uh, it's a rental product, obviously, but it is very, very, very difficult. You know, we we. We've built 30,000 affordable houses in the last 12 years in South Africa, and, and we can't we can't get an appointment with anyone in government. We've done this with money that's been raised, you know, from from offshore multinational DFIs. You know, we brought money into the country to build affordable housing. We currently own and manage about 12,000 affordable housing rental units, but we can't we can't even get an appointment with government. You know, there's. I'll, I'll give you an example. We opened, uh, we we um, launched a site um, in uh, Soccer Point today, or actually in Belfast Bay today in Namibia. Um, we had invited the mayor and the local councillors. Uh, they responded to our calls. They were enthusiastic. They were on site five minutes before they were due to be there. There was not a word of politics spoken. They just spoke enthusiastically about the development and the supply of affordable housing in an area that really needs it. And then they left, you know, and uh, they said, whatever help you need, call us. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we don't get that level, level of assistance from government. It, it doesn't stop us. We, we are excited about developing the relationship with the SHRA, where we've had our first um, approval and we'll be building shortly for really the lower LSM levels that really, really need the supply and in areas close to work opportunities and that's what we do but we could we could get much more assistant from a more proactive and and you know it's in everybody's interest every time you build a development if steve builds five thousand units that's five thousand rates and taxes bills that never used to go out before and the same with us you know every unit we build we pay rates and taxes we contribute to the economy our tenants live closer to work they can they can generate more pro productivity um, that's our space, you know, and we unfortunately, yeah, it's it's difficult. We don't we don't get the access. We can't call people, meet with them. You know, they're just not there. And uh, the the numbers show it in in the Western Cape where governance is a bit better, and uh, the regulatory environment and the administered prices are a little bit more realistic. It's a bit easier. So what does that mean? That means you tend to do more in areas like that. And Steve, your results show that. You know, there's a shift from Gauteng yep. operations to Western Cape just because there's people to talk to on the other end of the phone and in the office. And that's really what we need. And and that's why we need, I agree with you, uh, Professor, we need some kind of a change that shakes everybody and says, listen, we're all in this together. We, we want to supply housing and we know where the need is. You know, the need is on the lowest of the low end and and that's where we all need to operate but to do that we need assistance you know there should be there's bucket loads of government land that could be released and you're know, on condition that it's affordable green housing that's built and 
um, you know, we're seeing that in, in places like Namibia, Botswana and Kenya. We're not seeing that in South Africa. And, and Carlos, your, your, your thoughts there? I mean, we know that people have been waiting for houses for the last 30 years in terms of waiting lists. What do you think fundamentally needs to change? I can most probably just speak on where I'm based. I, I think that's quite important. Um, in Durban and, and specifically in KZN, I think this province, um, I think the country needs something different, but this province and even the city needed something different. Otherwise, we can't invest and we need a stable environment for us to go and invest money in and yet we're in an environment that we're very politically unstable but then i look at the states that most probably their politics is even more unstable than ours yet there's still a stable environment for people to invest in so sometimes you can have an unstable uh, political party and yet there's an environment created at a level where you can still invest uh, from our side, what we found in Durban is that Durban had really been through some very terrible times, um, not fully recovering from COVID, then going on to flooding, and then obviously our uh, the, the 2021, those 15 days in July that were absolutely terrible and shocking, and hopefully we'll never experience that. But to get Durban going again, our, our plan with the city was to encourage them to really be the horse before the cart. And, and what you find in South Africa is that uh, all developers, including Steve and Rob and commercial and retail developers, is we have we have access to funding, we have access to go and develop. And we have, for us, for example, we commercial developers, we are a retailer, we're retailers and retail's done fairly well in the last couple of years. Obviously interest rates have worked in the last couple of months. But the reality is that if we, if government and even uh, the city in Durban doesn't invest in its infrastructure up front, um, it's very difficult to invest. I think Steve was alluding to that where they've got this massive amount of promises made and yet they don't deliver. And Steve will say, well, how did we get it right? I think the reason we got it right is because there was a wall. Um, and where you have a very undivided city like we have, um, even the ANC had to form a coalition at local government um, for it to rule. The one thing that was quite unanimous is that I think the city realized that it couldn't carry on as usual. So I'm giving it more from a, a, a local and not national level. And what we found is that when we went and started approaching the city um, for infrastructure funding, we were getting the city fully supporting it, which means 200 odd councillors voting in favour, not some abstaining and not some saying that they vote against. Because the reality is that if you're in council and if you live in Durban, you want your city to be successful. You want to be successful. And we, we were able to get the city on board to go and put this infrastructure over 600 million rand. And we've come beyond and invested another another 1.4 and another 500 million. So most probably there's about four and a half, five million rand of investment behind that. Then, and, and it was quite easy for us to achieve that because we were dealing at local level. The city knew that it was coming from a, a position that had really been hammered over the last couple of years. Yet, I think there was some, all the political parties agreed something had to be done differently. So from us, whether we say, you know what, is the environment to get more housing or not. The environment was for us to get good infrastructure, but to change the way of how that infrastructure is managed going forward. I think if we carry on thinking that local government um, is going to be able to sustain growth and the growth that we need to achieve between 4 and 6%, and at the same time still manage that infrastructure, I think we, 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 we're not being realistic. So one of the things we did is we said, look, you invest in the infrastructure and allow the private sector to manage that infrastructure. So for example, with the city, what we've managed to achieve is that we say, look, you put certain amount of roads in, we'll contribute towards it, but at the same time, we'll also pay towards the water treatment works, but we operate that. It's not the city's obligation to worry about whether the manholes uh, overflowing. Um, it's up to us to have water reservoirs. It's up to us to have Obviously, electricity does become sometimes of a challenge, but there's other uh, 
things you can do to have uh, energy. And so we managed to persuade the city to rather allow us to manage our own precinct. And that is really what we're doing with the city that we're creating is we've taken a lot away from local government and we've taken responsibility for it as business people because we can't rely on government to, to do anything when it comes to maintaining or keeping infrastructure because the backlog is so terrible at the moment. And I'm using, again, the city, but I mean, yeah, if you look yeah. even at Johannesburg and other areas that uh, we follow the news, uh, it's not much better. So private investors now have really got to say, well, look, we want change. We want something, to, something different has got to happen. But that must be right across, not only at political national level, but it must be how you actually implement it. And that's what we're doing yeah. as on our side as the endeavor. No, I understand. And I think and I, exactly. I mean, it was one of the things I'm going to ask you is about the, the trend of privately managed precincts and the public private sector uh, participation and how you take the burden off municipalities in terms of, exactly like you say, infrastructure, service delivery, and so forth. JJ, I know you need to need to go in a couple of minutes, but I just want to ask you one one last question. It, it's it's raised by Carol Church. Uh, it's raised by a, a few others, and it comes down to the squandering of of funds through corruption and how that impacts or negatively impacts education, health, and job creation. I've listened to a lot of stuff where you've been very outspoken about the level of corruption within government, and you've spoken about how now with a lot of guys coming out of power, they are literally plundering wherever they can. Can that change going forward? Well, corruption is everywhere in the world, so we can only hope to reduce it. Now, the, let me tell you, the problem in South Africa is that there's no consequence management, if, if I may use that fancy term. In other words, the people who have been, you know, who have been mentioned in the state capture report, for example, there's over a hundred people uh, who have not been uh, prosecuted. They have not been called to order in any way. They have not taken any responsibility. And I, I, I hope that if we have a coalition government, that's the, those should be some of their first orders of business because Corruption takes away from the resources right, that you need uh, to to do all those other things, health, uh, education, and so on. So, so you need con a consequence management. It don't change much if the ANC goes back to power unilaterally or as a, a continuing one-party state. Because, I mean, we don't need any more evidence. You, you only have to look at the Auditor General's report. That tells you how much money is wasted every year, 50 billion, 60 billion, every year for the last four or five years, uh, same report. And nobody has gone to prison for that. And these people have contravened the Corruption Act, they've contravened the PFMA, they've contravened all sorts of things. So uh, unfortunately, the, the corruption has not, we, we don't have a handle over it at the moment. And we're, we're just talking about things that are in the public arena. Imagine how much is not in the public arena in terms of rigged tenders, and so on. So um, one hopes that uh, if there's a coalition government, these people can watch each other and not steal so much. I'm going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> thank you. Steve, uh, a couple of questions here about the forecast on the property market. I mean, what is your advice to potential investors who at the moment are saying, no, they want to wait until after elections to decide if they want to invest or not. What are your thoughts there? Um, you know, I think properties are fundamental. You put a roof over your head. So I don't think the election, if you need to um, buy a property, the election, whether it's now or in a month's time, is going to make any difference. You know, this country is still a fantastic country. I think the professor was very, very clear. and I, I don't think there's going to be a huge change. So I don't see the reason for waiting. What I do see a reason for waiting is let's see some interest rate cuts. You know, I can my advice to youngsters hang in there a little bit. Let's see an interest rate cut, and then you know we've done fantastic work with the IFC in Washington. Um, it's was probably three years ago. I don't know if my fantastic partner was around. He probably tell me I'm wrong. It's probably four years ago. We started working with the IFC in Washington. You now I've been a champion of green, realistic green. And we've, we've really made some good inroads and we've managed to, to really work well with the different institutions to get our clients a reduction in their mortgage rate. And, you know, these reductions, I'm still dreaming and trying hard 
if I had a magic wand is one of the questions are, I would love to insist or get the banks to agree to a 1% reduction in the best mortgage rate out there because the developer is fully green because it does make a difference. You know, if interest rates start dropping, everything becomes more affordable. Get out there and buy. You know, I know Rob does a lot of rental, which is also, Rob, I think you do a fantastic job. And, you know, rental is important. But, you know, ultimately, in this country with the legacy of apartheid, you know, we need to get people into homes. They need to get proper title. There needs to be some capital growth, which can obviously only come with the back of macro growth and start getting getting themselves ahead in life. You know, like we've all worked, you know, Carlos, Rob, yourself, Steph, we've all worked our backsides off to get ahead of it in life. And, you know, the people need to also get out there, work hard, get into decent housing, and let's let's get this country moving. Um, exactly. And, and Rob, I mean, the, there's obviously a lot of business leaders and so forth on this on this call right now in terms of watching. I mean, I've been following quite a lot of Franz Cornier, that, who a lot of you guys have probably listened to, and he talks about what the private sector could do to control its own actions post-elections, and he refers to building institutions and communities of influence. And in your mind, I mean, what, what can the private sector do to, to control the destiny of this country? So, so look, we're all here. And I think all of us on this call are not planning on going anywhere. So, you know, we can't climb into our shells and disappear. We have to carry on, you know, and I'm still optimistic that things will change. I'm optimistic that um, we that the economy is going to get better. I'm optimistic that uh, government will improve and that there will be less corruption. So um, for that reason, we're carrying on. We're still raising capital. We're very focused on finding an affordable solution for the very low end of the spectrum, you know. So people that that earn less than 22,000 Rand a month household income make up 70 or 80% of uh, of the home owners and occupiers in our in our economy. It's just it's staggering. So, you know, from our point of view, we, we want to find ways of bringing cheaper product onto the market. Um, you know, even where we operate, we need to get cheaper. We need to find more affordable ways of doing it. But to have a government that could participate, you know, we've, we're fortunate in our in, in our funds. We actually have um, shareholding by the NHFC, which is part of Human Settlements. They, they've, they've worked with us and they've given us money, uh, equally the trial. Um, and that's to try and press down into the lower levels of ownership. So if we can bring a much more affordable product online, and I'm talking like below 300,000. That should be what we're targeting because that's where the, the vast majority of our population are. And if they can get ownership um, and get capital gain on those assets and create wealth, that, that, that'll that be a, a big start. And and that's what we're striving for. You know, we haven't been able to get that low. Um, I, every, everyone that's uh, on the call will understand the cost of doing business. And the biggest cost, one of the biggest costs is time. You know, unfortunately, things take very, very long. And it turn, turns out that that time could be higher than your land cost because by sitting on your hands for 12, 18, 24 months while you're waiting for plan approvals or infrastructure or, you know, that that costs a lot of money. It's, you know, one of your biggest development costs. Um, and unfortunately, in South Africa at the moment, we have to find a way of fast tracking um, the process because we can make everything a lot cheaper if we can fast track the process. Okay. And then, I mean, Carlos, I mean, we're going to, we have to wrap up soon, but quite a few questions around what the real estate industry can do to reduce unemployment as a collective. And I guess the answer to that would be doing what a lot of you guys are doing in terms of forging ahead and making development happen. Hey. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, where Rob was just, talking about fast tracking process. I mean, that is really the challenge we have in property. And and again, I'm, I'm not the public relations officer for Durban, but the one good thing that Durban has done is, is to establish a catalytic projects unit. And that has made a big difference on our processes. I mean, you've got regulatory processes that have got to follow its path. But what happens is that something can sit on someone's desk for two weeks and, and they go and leave and the next person doesn't know what's going on. So what Catalytic Projects has done is taken all new investments coming into Durban that are significant and they really help you 
guide these processes, that speed up the processes. Um, for example, Rob, just to give an idea, today, in the old days, we'd wait nine months to get plan approval. Um, when you go through catalytic projects, it won't take you more than 90 days. And I'm talking retail now specifically, and, uh, and, and specifically shopping centers and more. So yes, um, the fast tracking process in our business uh, is very important. I think our city is doing a great job in, in that regard. Creating jobs, I mean, that's exactly, I mean, without people having work, you know, how do they afford to buy something and maintain that little house that they bought and how do they pay for water and electricity that is going up with double digit numbers and, and, and so forth. Um, I think it's everybody and in real estate, we do create a lot of work. Um, and, and if you look at just our development and, and what uh, um, Baldwin's going to be doing with us uh, uh, towards the end of the year next year, we currently have 1,330 people on, on, on a building site that were not there a year and a half ago. Uh, and that's going to go up to about 2,000. And after completion, on the first phase on the 27th of March next year, we're going to have about 680 full-time jobs. Now, that might seem insignificant, but, you know, if there's 10 of those taking place in a metropolitan area, that's 7,000 people getting work, I don't think we're going to totally eliminate unemployment. But the more the real estate sector can develop, um, and, and if you look at what uh, Rob does and what Steve does, they do mass, which is exactly what you need. You, you know, you don't need those developments where people are developing a unit at uh, seven and selling it at eight, seven, eight million rand, because that will take a long time and only a few people will work on that. But if you've got these massive developments of residential and commercial, um, and if you see at the moment what's happening with Sandra, the infrastructure of 12 and a half billion rand they're putting in KZN, that's creating a lot of job. And where the government has failed very badly is making these bold announcements about infrastructure. And then when they start going, they stop processes and they don't carry on with them. So I think real estate can create a lot of uh, employment opportunities. Well, Steph, if you, if you yes, have a look at where a lot of the jobs that have been lost have been lost from, it's the construction industry. Mm -hmm. Think about Murray and Roberts, Group 5, Basil Reed, you know, the, the construction sectors of those massive big companies that used to employ thousands and thousands of people. They're just gone. You know, it's, yeah. uh, they're gone. I worked for Group 5 in the 90s. There were 50,000 employees. The company's gone. <laughs> Gee, Rob, I'm older than you. I worked for Group 5 <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> seems like seems like a production line of notes, hey? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, but I'm okay guys. <laughs> Stefan wasn't born yet, guys. <laughs> well, thanks. That makes, it, that makes it feel a lot better. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but guys, I mean, I think just a thank you to everyone who has posted questions. We always said we want to keep you no longer than, a, than an hour. I think there are a huge amount of positives that come out of this. I think there's perspective, there's confidence, and there are people who are driving things. And if this is just a, an element of the private sector in terms of what they're doing, how they understand the need to collaborate with um, with the public sector and how they're prepared to drive things across the line. And that's really positive. And I think if you listen to what JJ was saying, is that we, yeah, we, we're a nation of, of people who have differing opinions when it comes to politics, but generally across the board, we have millions of people who share similar values. And that's what makes us unique as a country. And that's what makes us, us, us special. And I think the message from this we wanted to say is that we, we there are lots of leaders on, the, on, this, on this chat across the board. And none of us want to be pass passive participants. We know everyone needs to go out and vote and, and that, that goes without saying. But the reality is, is that we can focus on the facts and we can look through all this murky space that we're in. But the reality is we can be active agents and not passive observers. And I think that's the, the lesson I've learned from everyone here today is that um, it's, the, it's, it's the active participants who can really make change in this country. And yeah, I think we've got a, a hell of a positive future ahead. And I hope those of you who've been part of the chat have, have got, gained some insights. And I'm very grateful to our panelists. Um, you guys are legends and, and keep doing what you're doing. That's what we need. So um, we're going to be sharing a recording of this tomorrow to all of those who, who were here and if you want to share it. Um, and yeah, we thank you for all your time and we hope you have a, a wonderful evening ahead. And um, yeah, we 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 excited for what this country has to hold. So thanks very much.
Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Cheers, Thank you guys. Bye-bye, Steve. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot.